All right, this is the first video in a series of digital engineers touching an analog console. Okay, Ben. Yes. <laughs> now, full disclosure, I have been wanting to make this video series for a while, and Ben and I have already been poking this because he helped me bring some stuff to the house, and I'm like, well, I have to show you the console. <laughs> so what are your first impressions? It's really cool. <laughs> play with the knobs so the first thing we talked about was the fader feel how yes. how much better like i i can't believe how much better it is. i've only ever used like an out a cheap allen and heath board as an analog console but which one did you use uh just a gl 2400 hey don't talk shit no on. no no a great good board i'm not saying it's bad <laughs> it's just like this is like if you take good and then you multiply it by 10 i mix a lot of shows on a gl 2400 yeah Sweet. So the com the conversation that Ben and I were having uh, before I decided to ruin it uh, by pulling my phone out and filming was um, the ease of use with an analog console versus a digital console. I feel like anybody can walk up to an analog console like this, at least that has some experience on an analog console and get a show up and moving Yeah. versus really needing a console tech on digitals. So the point in the conversation that we are entering right now is Ben and I were talking about the aux section here. So all of the colored faders are just the aux masters. Clam it up now. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Am I supposed to talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's pretty self-explanatory. How it, I mean, because like... You've got your sends right here, right? Right. Yeah. You get you just send it to the augs like you would any other console, but it's all just right in front of you there, so you don't have to think about layers and stuff like that. The uh, the shop that Ben works for uh, when he's not working at LM did just take delivery of an HD ninety six, so yes. I've never used an HD ninety six. I've never even uh, seen one in real life, but. I did spend a lot of time on a Pro One, um, and it's like if you look at the meters and that, they're very they look like Pro Ones, or I should say the Pro Ones yeah, look like just the Heritage. The Pro series in general. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I don't know. I mean, there certainly is the form factor. I mean, Ben and I were talking about the channel recap process and how this is uh, certainly a labor of love with uh, with this particular thing, but. Um, you know what was interesting is I did a a, a, a rental. Somebody is borrowing uh, Dan from Spirit of the Bear is is borrowing my um, Midas M thirty two C to do some recording stuff. He had an interface die, and we were talking about he, he's just using it from my show file, and he goes, "Well, explain the matrixy to me," and I'm like, "Well, it would be a heck of a lot easier to show you on this analog console." the difference between an yeah, aux and a matrix true. because it it shows you so clearly yeah because i mean that was something back when i was trying to learn how consoles used that i was like what the heck is this thing about like there's already groups why do i need matrices but they definitely have their use i just wasn't sure how it worked i feel like that's the question that everybody asks what's the difference between a group and a vca and then what's the difference between an aux and a matrix yeah that's like once you get beyond how do I EQ this, <laughs> you know, one, and then I feel like the next step is like pre-fader, post-fader. Yeah. And then then what's the difference between a VCA group, an aux, and a matrix? So, yeah, it is it is very interesting. This thing does have some cool functionality to it. Um, I think the first thing that everybody sort of looks at is this big garden guarded SIP button. Is you can you can transfer the console into solo in place, oh, which is you know like no one other than recording would want that because <laughs> I have it in solo in place mode because it's yeah recording, it's recording console, console here. but no one else in the real world. I guess also if you're using it for broadcast, yeah, that would be another place you'd want it. You know what is interesting is that so the Heritage series had four consoles. There was the Heritage One Thousand which is actually a Dynacord product, the Heritage 2000, which is this console, the Heritage 3000, and then the Heritage 4000. So the 2000 and the 3000 are the same frame. So if you look up Dave Ratt videos, mm -hmm. he has a 3000, 
which oh. is the same frame as this. Is that the one he has the big picture behind him? Yeah. <laughs> the only difference between the 3000 and the 2000 are the oxes. So this has um, eight, it has eight mono oxes and then two stereo oxes, but you can flip the two stereo oxes at the bottom here to, to be mono. So it can be 12 oxes of mono. And the, um, uh, the 3000 is 24 oxes. So every ox per channel is stereo. Jeez. But they don't have dedicated groups on that console. So the idea was the 2000 is a front of house console, the 3000 is a monitor console. But it's kind of weird because I thought that I wanted mono oxes when I was looking for these. Because mm -hmm. the 2000s are very rare. Like the 3000s are everywhere. Hmm. And I thought I wanted mono oxes, but once now that I'm incorporating uh, outboard gear, I want stereos. Oh. So it's like, <laughs> I want my delay to be stereo. I want my pitch to be stereo. And it's yeah. it's not like, you know, you're not sending it to like a monitor. You know, it's it's interesting. And then the other thing is groups. So this has a, a group button and then it has group masters. Whereas like if you want to make a group or an aux, or you have to make a group through an aux on the 3000. It's, you know, you just put it at Unity, basically. Oh, okay. yeah. And that's like, and that's like some of the like Midas level stuff. Like I don't have a lot of experience on large format analog consoles. I don't know if that's like a normal thing for it. Like if you sure get on like a PM4000 or something like that, yeah. how do you make it, how do you make it a group versus, versus an aux? And I feel like even on the, on the M32, if you want to make it a group, you have to do it like that. Like, you basically just send it to an aux master. Yeah, and then, you, well, you, you can set it up the, in the config pages. As a group? As a subgroup, and then it works a little differently. But it, you, you can use an aux like a group. It's not, it doesn't have to be set that way. I was going to say, I have a, a, drum, a drum group and a vocal group on my M32. Yeah. I do the same thing. And it's because we're smart guys, man. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> but anyway... Any other observations before we let the fine people of YouTube go? No, I just it's it's cool to see in person finally. <laughs> we gotta we gotta set you up a mix on this. Oh yeah. Do you see its primitive automation? Yeah, I saw that. That's pretty sweet. <laughs> Do you know how it works? No. So there are these green lights on each fader. Okay. So see how it says one through ten? Yeah. So those will either be your VCA assigns or that lets you recall the fader position. Oh, so okay. basically when you move a fader, the lights will go out if it's not where the fader was. Mm -hmm. And then when the fader is in its right position, like two of the lights will illuminate. Okay. So which is pretty hilariously bad. <laughs> but when you think about it, like that's an awful lot of logic for the year two thousand. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That's always the first thing that everybody asks me. They're like, do the faders move? And it's like, no. <laughs> but it has automation. It's like, kind of. <laughs> it automates the remembering process. <laughs> I think the benefit of the automations was probably for mute groups because it automates the fader position and then it also automates its, its state of mute. Yeah. So like on each channel, just like the Pro Series, it has mute safe, fader safe, and automation safe. So you can exclude it. Or, you know. Yeah. I mean, I can also see it being like, oh, you're mixing a live show where they want, you know, like any other place where you use automation in a live show, they want more effect on this song. So it's just kind of like, oh, I don't have to remember it. I just go to that scene for that song and it can rem re remind me where to put it. It is interesting because like your, your switch locks. So the console will go into its default stage as lock. So to make any change, you have to disengage the lock button. And then if you want to make an automation request, you hit the VCA button. And then that and then that puts it in. And then in this automation panel right here, which I know that the Legend console, which everybody really hates, has the, uh, the same automation bank to it. Because I think the Heritage stuff came out in 98... I think the Legend console came out in like 2002 kind of thing. Okay. Which, I mean, even is, is pretty crazy to, to look at that, to, to think about 2002, that we were still using analog consoles and marketing them. Because I, I think the Yamaha PM1D came out in 2001. Oh, okay. You know, it's like large format concert yeah. digital. Yeah. I can't think of any other consoles that were around at that time. I know Innovison was, if you're hip with them, 
No, I don't think I've heard of them. They were very esoteric. LM had one client that had Anovis in consoles, oh. and they were like digital, large format, super expensive. But they sounded really good. But it was like nobody could figure out how to work on them because like nobody <laughs> bought them, you know. And then I feel like we made five D cases forever from like two thousand four, two thousand five to probably two thousand ten. I bet we built a PM five D case on every production schedule. Like we we built hundreds of them. Yeah. I bet Maryland Sound still owns the most PM five Ds out of <laughs> out of any company ever. I think they did the last. I think they did Biden's inauguration on a oh, on a five D. Really? Still. That's funny. Yeah, they had Focusrite. I'm fairly don't, certain that they had Focusrite RedNet on the back they end. Broke, don't fix it, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> Maryland Sound is into the five Ds. Um, you know what else is kind of cool on this that you really wouldn't you really wouldn't see is well, a the matrices are super super easy to get to. Um, but like the Allen and Heath, you can hit your matrices at the groups here, which I know that there are 96 knobs there because I had to clean them all. <laughs> so you can either hit your matrices from the groups or from the master fader, um, which is, you know, obviously pretty standard for, for digital consoles now, but the, the monitor channel in here is pretty neat because you do have your, you know, in Midas M32 world, you do have your B output or your mono output rather. So if you want to do your subs from your mono, oh, okay, yeah. you just assign it from down here, stereo versus mono. Um, and then there's some cool things where there's your talk back. There's your, uh, it has a signal generator built in. Oh, sweet. So you can run that. So much like the, much like the, uh, you know what, actually, now that I think about this, the M32 stuff doesn't have the talk button or does it? Talk? Yeah, it's it, got two. Per channel? Oh, for each channel. So no. with this, I know that the Pro 1 has all that in there. Um, and I'm now I'm trying to remember if the M32 has it or not off the top of my head. So basically what it is if, is if you want to send your, your signal to a specific channel, you just engage the talk button. Oh, yeah, it does have that. Does it? You just got to go in the menu and like figure it out. But it, yeah. I was going to say, that was the one thing I remember I remember getting on the Pro 1 because I spent a lot of time on the Pro 1 right when I was learning the X32. I'm like, what the hell is this talk button? What does that do? Um, you know what's actually kind of crazy is at the top of the channels, there's a little blue button up here that you have to engage with a paperclip. I don't know if you can see that with me holding my cell phone over it, but that's how you put the channel into talk mode. Oh. So if you want to send uh, your your oscillator down the channel to check it, Oh, okay. you have to you have to click it in like that. You're just inserting that sound or that flow signal flow. But it was amazing. I remember um I remember looking at like being for load ins at concerts and being like, how do they send that oscillator into the subs? That's crazy. You just hit the talk button on the matrix. And you can send uh, the lowest it sends is fifty hertz, which I think is cool. <laughs> so you can have uh, 50 hertz. you can have a sine wave um or pink noise. And you just hit that red button and it goes to pink. And then it also has an option for an external noise generator, hmm. which is pretty crazy. Yeah. There's there's XLRs. There's a stereo pair of XLRs on the back that will allow you to do an outboard noise generator. Dedicated inputs for noise. Pretty it is pretty crazy. I, I need to do a video on the back of this thing so you can see what inputs are on the back. Like, it's insanity. Yeah. Some of the stuff that they can give you. Like, I remember when I got this, I just looked at the at the monitor card in here. And I'm like, what do you do with all of this stuff? Like, what is stereo output B? Why do you need <laughs> stereo output B? Like, what the heck does that do? It's pretty, pretty crazy. And I, I would assume that stereo output B is probably a broadcast mix. That makes sense. If you don't have enough matrices. Yeah. I always like posting videos like this because the comment sections are usually pretty good. You'll get somebody in there that like have used these before. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, that's what this is for. <laughs> you know what else is pretty cool, actually, that I didn't think about? Um, the master channel has a direct input. So oh. you bypass everything in the console and it has a direct input. And each of the groups has a direct input in it also, which is pretty cool. Can you, well, the direct inputs, can that be, is it separate from the insert? Yes. Oh, okay. So like I, there are instances because the board's kind of taken apart 
um, that I've I've run out of returns, mm -hmm. like for effects. And I'm like, well, I'll just return it into a group, you know. And each of the groups have direct outputs too, which is also kind of cool. Okay. So like in in the world of DAW, you can you can print your stems like that. Oh. So yeah. as you're printing your your two track, you can also do all your stems, which is pretty cool. Now there's a lot of interesting functionality. I, I still think that you probably really don't need a console. I would say that there's a 99% <laughs> chance that you don't need a console, but there is some cool stuff that it does in the modern the modern age of of recording. I will say that the one thing that I don't like about it is just the fact that when they lay it out, you've got your EQ section all the way up here. Dude. And then your aux is here. And it's like, I understand in terms of the signal flow, but you probably are touching this more than you're touching this. You know why? Because we're short. <laughs> I bet if we were taller. We, uh, so, all right, uh, YouTube, I'm outing both of us for being <laughs> for being short guys. That's why. Because I think of the same thing. Because I, I built this stand for this thing so that it would it would have racks underneath it because this is literally in a bedroom in my house. So it's like I had to maximize my floor space. So you have to use it as a standing thing. And I like am leaning over this thing all the time. But actually, you know who I, I'm fairly certain, fact check me on this comment section. I'm fairly certain that Gamble consoles had the preamp as the very bottom knob and then the EQ. It was what we're talking about. Interesting. Which again, those are a holy grail console, huh. a gamble. Yeah, <laughs> I've never, I've never seen one. I think a lot of people have never seen one, but they're supposedly amazing. See, I mean, I don't know. I'm kind of like in the boat where it makes sense to have the gain like real far away because you kind of don't want to accidentally bump it or something, you know. But the Q being far, I mean, even for a tall person though, like that's still real far away. Yeah. You know. It's yeah, I mean again, and I, I have a hard time seeing the EQ, which is actually it's pretty crazy. I mean, again, like you want to talk about this. Um, this is four bands of parametric EQ oh, wow. with Q. Damn. So like in the year two thousand, because I going back to Allen and Heath, I think the mid bands were were fully parametric, but I think you had a fixed high and low, right? Yeah. Think so because what what's the the low band is usually like 100 hertz 80 100 something like that yeah yeah and then it's like an 80 so you have on this eq it is a fully sweepable and engageable high pass filter wow plus all four bands are fully parametric and you have a direct out on on each channel that's pretty sweet. which is pretty sweet yeah. like the eq on this console is ridiculously good i mean so, that's just as powerful as an m32 like that's in that Oh, it's just yeah. as powerful? Yeah. You don't think it's more powerful uh, than an M32? <laughs> <laughs> That's, I, I don't know. I can't argue that. We're just going to leave it at that. <laughs> not going to upset people too much. <laughs> well, the funny thing is, so uh, Dan Dan came and picked up that the my M32C that's just in a four-space rack yeah. on uh, Saturday, and I was telling him, I'm like, you know what's insane? Is that this thing has eight less channels than... Or no, it has sixteen less channels rather yeah. than uh, than the uh, the heritage in the other room, and it doesn't have a compressor on every channel. It doesn't have a gate on every channel. It doesn't have effects on any channel. Yeah, it's pretty wild. Interesting. So anyway, how far we've come. This thing weighs five hundred and fifty pounds. They had to bring it in through the front window. <laughs> That's pretty. For forty crazy. for forty eight channels. You should just get the stand made so that it angles it more. And then <laughs> you can't see. I'm giving Ben a huge <laughs> scowl. <laughs> All right, we'll wrap this up. We have to get back to actual work. Thanks for stopping by. Look forward to the comments. See ya. Bye.